Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Guild Hall. I'm Andrea Grover, the executive director. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is today's program is one of those you know treats that you get to experience as a director that maybe you could never have imagined. I don't think I've ever met a Duke in my life, but I did just now backstage. Um, so this um, conversation is going to be moderated by Anthony Kalnick, who is the global head of content at Sotheby's. He's joined by the Duke of Devonshire, whose um, Chatsworth collection is now on view at Sotheby's at their new space at 72nd and York. This is a 100,000 square foot exhibi exhibition space with 20 foot ceilings and some galleries that are 100 feet long. So it's a really remarkable space. The other thing that's remarkable about it is the exhibition is on view for free um, through September 13th, so 10 weeks, opening yesterday. Um, so uh, Anthony Kalnick will be moderating. Uh, David Korins will be joining him. Um, he is a stage designer who did um, Hamilton, Dear Evan Hansen, Beetlejuice, a number of other things, as well as designing the exhibition. Um, and we're very grateful to Sotheby's for having this event here at Guildhall. We are also partnering this year with Sotheby's on our summer gala, which is on August 9th, and we'll be celebrating the exhibition, Ugo Rondinone, Sunny Days. So please enjoy the program. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and welcome to Guild Hall. I'm Anthony Kalnick. I'm the global head of content at Sotheby's. So that means that I get to tell the stories behind the amazing artworks that we sell and the incredible collectors who are really at the heart of our business. Now I'm also the former deputy director of the Guggenheim Museum. And I have to say when I left the museum world for the auction house, I had a little bit of trepidation, a little bit of um, anxiety that I would be leaving a team that was responsible for making all these incredible international loan shows and bringing them to New York. But um, Sotheby's today is not the company that I joined 10 years ago. Just this past May, we opened 100,000 square feet of amazing museum quality gallery space. It was designed by OMA, the architecture firm founded by Rem Koolhaas. And actually, Rem Koolhaas designed a Guggenheim Museum branch when I was with the museum. And um, yesterday, as part of a celebration of our 275th year in business, we did something that no other auction has ever done to my knowledge. We opened this vast international loan show. Uh, it is going to run for 10 weeks, as you've just heard. It is free and open to the public. And um, that's a pretty amazing thing. It's something that has led us to come out here for a little road show to introduce you to the exhibition and the two people who are central to its creation. Now I know from my years at the museum world that in order for an exhibition to succeed, it has to have a really good story behind it. Well, with Treasures from Chatsworth, we have an amazing story to tell and I'm going to introduce you to it to begin with through this short video. Every time I come around the corner, I know what to expect. Still, it blows me away. Chatsworth isn't a museum, but it is a house which has always been lived in. It's got a beating heart, this house. It's alive. Being a good collector means being true to your own passions and your own heart. The Duke and Duchess are true collectors in the grand sense of collecting. The kind of collectors I'm always drawn to are those that are really passionate. What you need is a combination of passion and knowledge. Commissioning a piece is exciting. Throughout history, the Cavendish have been so extraordinarily perceptive about working with the greatest artists or artisans of their particular time. This place is absolutely jaw-dropping in whatever field, painting, textiles. There's layers upon layers upon layers of collecting, different tastes, different times, different personalities. If you like something enough, you should buy it, acquire it, Collective and disregard other people's opinions. That's what I think is a really wonderful collection. <laughs> so
So that is the trailer to a 13-part web series that Sotheby's produced three years ago. Um, it won a lot of critical awards, it garnered an audience in the millions, and it really inspired the exhibition. Now, I'm, I'm actually curious, before we start the program, how many people have been to Chatsworth House in, in person? It's a lot. That's great. For the rest of you that don't worry, we're bringing Chatsworth House to you. Uh, right here today, we have the sort of living embodiment of Chatsworth with the Duke of Devonshire. So Stoker Devonshire, as he's known, is the 12th Duke of Devonshire, the 16th generation of his family to have lived in this magnificent house. And he assumed, uh, he assumed uh, his role as Duke in 2004, and since then has been a sort of astonishing, energetic caretaker of this extraordinary house, collection, and gardens. And I think what you'll find out today is that he is passionate about make, sharing this extraordinary place with as many people as possible. We also have David Corns, who is an extraordinary award-winning creative director, the designer of three major Broadway experiences, uh, Hamilton, Dear Evan Hansen, and, and Beetlejuice, but a uh, much wider range than, than that. Um, recently actually opened an exhibition, uh, Hamilton the Exhibition, which opened in Chicago, and it will embark on a national tour directly after, I guess. So uh, to begin, what I'd like to do is ask Stoker to do something that he's probably done countless times, which is to give a tour of, of Chatsworth. And I'm going to give you this clicker as a sort of <laughs> way to do it for this audience. Thank you, Anthony, very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so pleased uh, to see you all here. And I just do hope that uh, you find the next few minutes interesting. Before I start with a little tour, I really would like to thank well, I'd like to thank David Corrins for doing what he's done. When you go to the exhibition at Sotheby's, you'll see something which is really remarkable, almost as remarkable as the contents, the, 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 the objects which we sent over from England. He transformed it into uh, an exhibition, the like of which I have never seen, and that is down to his amazing imagination and uh, extraordinary um, way he has of getting into a subject quite quickly. I'd also like very much to thank uh, Sotheby's. Uh, we've, Chatsworth has, had a, has a long relationship with Sotheby's, more of that during my talk, but um, without Sotheby's support, this exhibition, this event would never have happened. And I'd also very much like to thank uh, Rocco Forti Hotels. They have helped considerably with the exhibition. They've helped Sotheby's a lot. I cannot recommend their hotels too highly. Brown's Hotel in London is one of the nicest places you'll ever wish to find. They have wonderful hotels, obviously, in Italy, which where the family originally came from. Uh, I knew Sir Charles Forty a little. He was uh, crowned the world champion Charleston dancer in uh, 1938, <laughs> and he came to lunch at Sotheby's about 25 years ago, uh, bef uh, shortly before he passed away, and he did a demonstration of his Charleston dancing, and I can tell you that I could absolutely understand why he was world champion. Anyway, his grandson, Charles, is here tonight, which is lovely. Um, as I say, I cannot recommend their hotels too, too strongly. They are such a high standard. They're full of really beautiful things. So, let's have a little look around Chatsworth. This is where we're lucky enough to live, uh, not in the whole house, you'll be glad to know. The house is... Um, is run by a charitable trust, more of that later, and we pay a rent to live there. Um, it was built to show off. The person who built the square house in the foreground was made uh, the first Duke of Devonshire by William and Mary uh, in 1694. William and Mary come to the English throne in 1688, the Glorious Revolution. And they were made dukes because they were, he was made duke because he was a big supporter of William and Mary, he was one of the few people who signed the invitation to come over. And so he built a house which stated very, very, very clearly that he was extremely powerful. He was extremely rich, and he covered it in gold. Uh, it was absolutely wonderful. And um, a lot of people would consider it. I don't yet know. I'm trying to find out what the locals thought about it, because he tore down a 150-year-old Elizabethan house to build it. And these days, if you did that, people would be deeply unhappy. But then maybe they were a bit more forward-looking. Anyway. I, I think they have a little understanding of teardowns here, so. Yeah, I know they understand teardowns, and that's actually where I learned the word. It uh, was in Miami. Anyway, so, um, so the house was built to show off, and so was the interior. And this is the first room that visitors see. It's called the Painted Hall for fairly obvious reasons. And the idea was 
that you arrived here and then you went upstairs um, to, to the even grander room. Before you did that, there's a passage here um, outside the chapel uh, and it's a little bit of a demonstration of what's happened at Chatsworth over the years. Uh, as Anthony said, we, my family had been there for quite a long time, and so we've accumulated various bits and pieces over the years. And in this passage, there's um, segments from Egypt of several, uh, from a long time before the birth of Christ. There's uh, um, uh, some ceramics by Edmund de Waal, which was a commission in 2006. And there's artworks from virtually all ages in between times. So that's a bit of a sort of thing that happens, as it does in your home on the mantelpiece. Stuff gets left there, and you think, oh, that was granite, we can't move that. So there's an element of that here. And then, further along the house, you get to the library. Uh, the ceiling is painted by an Italian artist called v Antonio Verio in about 1700, with wonderful uh, plaster, uh, plaster work by a man called Googe. It's easy to remember because somehow you gouge out the... Anyway, um, the, the, rest of the, um, the rest of the library is entirely Victorian, sort of about 1830, 1840. Uh, all, nearly all my family members, not me, but nearly all of my ancestors were called William. And so we stopped calling them, we gave them numbers, which I know you do in this country quite a lot. And so when I refer to him as the sixth duke, uh, that's so we can remember just calling him William Cavendish, William Devonshire, is really no good to anybody. Uh, the sixth duke uh, created this library. He, he loved buying books, and then he got fed up with buying books, so he started buying whole libraries, and he needed space to put them, and he made this rather wonderful room. Deep down fashionable when I was a child, now, of course, the height of fashion, so it just, you know, what goes round comes round. So, uh, get moving along, we get to the dining room, also built... Um, for the Sixth Duke, um, it, it, it was finished in about 1833, not about, in 1833. And in fact, the first dinner there uh, was attended by a young 13-year-old Princess Victoria, later to become Queen Victoria of England. It was her first so-called adult dinner, and I bet she thought it went on for much too long. Anyway, <laughs> it, it, it's a wonderful room. We do use it um, for big, grand dinners now and then, sometimes for family occasions. Um, Southern is entertained there now and then, and it, it, it's a lovely room to be in. Uh, it was built by that duke because he didn't have enough room in the house to entertain on the scale he wished. And just beyond it is perhaps the sort of jewel in the crown of the whole house and the collection. It's a top-lit contemporary art gallery. It was built at the same time as the dining room in about 1833, and it was built to house his collection of contemporary sculpture. Um, on, on, in the front, on the right, you'll see a, a large um, figure of the sleeping Endymion, uh, which was commissioned from Canova, who was working in Rome. Uh, and there's various other pieces of sculpture throughout the, 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 uh, uh, the whole display. Uh, some by, all, all by people of that date, were mostly working in Rome. There's about four or five pieces by Canova, Thorvalds and Campbell and so on. Uh, and we, about 10 years ago, after we'd moved in, we put it back to be exactly as it was um, in 1858 when the Duke died, because we thought it was unusual, to say the least, for it still to be complete. Nothing had disappeared. And uh, we are, I must say, very proud of it. Uh, Wyattville was the architect. And so that is w what there is um, in the house. It's a very short tour. There's, it takes a little bit longer if you're actually walking around. I, I actually think it's sort of relatable to this crowd, this, this example of a collector who has so much contemporary art that he needed to build a whole other wing to his home. Um, I know that that happens around here. So we have teardowns and new galleries as the connection between Chatsworth and, and the Hamptons. But um, you've, you've also, um, you've come from a very illustrious line of collectors. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the pre predecessors who made the most impact on the collection? Well, this is um, a painting of the person who became the first Duke. As you can see, um, he uh, hasn't stinted with his tailor. Um, <laughs> The groom who looked after the horse has gone a bit over the top as well. 
Um, it's a sort of look no hands, I'm in charge, the horse is only on two legs, but I'm pretty cool about that. Um, it's definitely saying um, I'm a really important person. It's, it's what you call a swagger portrait, and it, I think it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, it reflects exactly the spirit in which the house was built and in which he decorated. And this slide, um, these are um, two silver gilt um, so-called pilgrim bottles made in about 1700 by a silversmith called Loofs. Uh, they're called pilgrim bottles because they're loosely modeled on the leather bottles that pilgrims took on their pilgrimage, which they tied to their saddle. These are about a foot and a half high, not entirely appropriate for wearing, for, for, for carrying on, on the back, or on the saddle of your horse on the way to um, Campostella. Uh, but it was just the idea, and he wanted to have the biggest and the best by the best silversmiths, uh, the best painters, the best everything that he could get. And he employed a lot of the people who were working for William and Orange at, uh, William of Orange, King William, um, who was redoing uh, Hampton Court Palace at the same time. A lot of the artists were, were used by, by the Duke and, and by the King at the same time. Then sort of moving on, and I promise you I'm not going to tell you about each Duke because there's, uh, there's very, very little to say about several of them. You'll be delighted to hear. Um, this is the second Duke uh, who followed the first Duke, not surprisingly, and it's painted, um, it's painted, it was commissioned by him, so it's painted as he would hope to be painted as a collector. You can see uh, behind his uh, right hand uh, a, a, a coffre de mariage with various drawers which contained his very good coin collection and he'd got one of the coins in his fingers and he's showing it to the audience who are looking at the painting. Sadly, the coin collection was sold in the, towards the end of the 19th, early 20th century, but we still have the Goff de Mariage uh, upstairs. And so that's him in his Knight of the Garter kit, which uh, obviously he was incredibly proud of. And this is one of the things that he collected. He was, as well as coins, his main interest was old master drawings and he was one of the few really well-educated, really well-informed uh, collectors of that time. And this is a, a, a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci of Lida and the Swan. Uh, you, you may be able to see that in, on her tummy there's a little white mark, and it, that I just have to share a story with you. In 1938, my grandfather was asked by a gallery in Italy if he would lend this Leonardo drawing to a big exhibition of Leonardo's that they were going to have. And my grandfather said, no, I, I don't want to do that because he didn't say why not, but the reason was he knew the war was coming and he was worried about sending, sending um, a, a very important drawing uh, to Italy. But then my grandfather discovered that the king had uh, uh, promised to send all his Leonardo's, about 80 of them, I think, or an awful lot anyway. So my grandfather felt obliged uh, to follow the suit of the king and sent the drawing uh, to the exhibition. And of course the war duly took place and then, thanks largely to our American friends, came to an end and the drawing was still in Italy. And it came back to Chatsworth in, I think, about 1947 and the only thing that had happened to it was this little white mark. And we've left it as it is because we regard it as sort of a badge of honor uh, that it went to the exhibition. I hope the King's drawings weren't damaged. I don't think they were. There's been a whole series of wonderful exhibitions of the Royal Collection Leonardo's lately. So then... I'd just like to say that you were very brave to lend it to this exhibition, Stoker. So... This I like to think the, it's a bit less dangerous than it was in Italy in 1938, unless you're trying to tell me something I don't know about. Because so. we, were, we were just dumbfounded that this came over. I mean, it's no, we, it was, it's important. It's, it's a lovely thing. We, we, we don't lend it very often. After it's been lent this time, it'll be kept in complete darkness for at least three years, as all works on paper should be. So it's special for us, and I hope that you'll think it's special for, for you as well. So moving on. Uh, another uh, generation or two, this isn't actually a member of the Cavendish family, this is a man called Lord Burlington, who was an architect and a very great collector. Uh, he built Chiswick House in West London, he built Burlington House, which is where the Royal Academy is, uh, and he had property in South Ireland, and he had property in Yorkshire, and uh, a property uh, in, in a good deal of it. He also collected wonderfully high quality materials. He only had one surviving daughter on the left, uh, that's Charlotte, Charlotte Boyle, and she married the person who became the fourth Duke of Devonshire. 
And through her, she wasn't allowed to inherit her father's chattels or land because that's how it was in those days. But her grandson, her son rather, uh, his grandson was allowed to inherit it. And here is one of the paintings uh, that came with the Burlington inheritance. This is a painting, a, a not very big painting, about three foot square uh, by Rembrandt, uh, which is normally in our private apartments, but it's part of the exhibition at Sotheby's now. And I think the man's expression is very, very beautiful and um, interesting. Her son was the fifth duke, and this is a portrait of him looking pretty laid back and not all that attractive. Um, but he, um, he, he was, I think he got a pretty bad press, really, but he probably didn't deserve it. I, I, you, I don't know how much you can tell from portraits of people you've never met, but anyway. He married this lovely lady called Georgina Duchess. It was a, a film, a book by Amanda Foreman, turned into a, a movie called The Duchess, and she was the star of that, and uh, she was uh, his, his wife. Uh, she was a Spencer, uh, and she was a leader of fashion. She was very much involved in politics, which was unusual for uh, women in that period. Uh, she had her faults. She was an inveterate gambler, and um, she wasn't very well. She didn't. She only lived to her late 40s, uh, but she was a bit of a star. And this painting uh, by Gainsborough is also in the exhibition. It had a, a very checkered history. It was sold. Uh, uh, for the highest price ever paid for £10,000 soon after it had been painted. Uh, the next day, it was stolen from the gallery from Agnews who bought it, and it was um, kept in the possession of the thief, a man called Worth, uh, for 25 years. And then the Pinkerton Agency finally tracked Mr. Worth down and got the picture back. It then went into the Huntington Collection, and uh, eventually it appeared on the market about 20 years ago, and we were able to acquire it. So it wasn't coming home, but it's lovely to have the picture. It was originally full length, but one of its owners, before it was sold, didn't have room over her mantelpiece for the full picture. So understandably, I suppose you could say, she cut the bottom half off. <laughs> this is um, the fifth Dukes and Georgina's son, another William Cavendish. He became um, Duke in... Um, 1811, when he was 21, and he really um, got motoring on the shopping front in a very big way. He, he added a lot to, um, to Chatsworth. He built a big wing, which we've already talked about, the sculpture gallery, the dining room, and so on. He rebuilt the house in Ireland. He rebuilt the house in Yorkshire. Um, he had to... Um, he, he, he was a very, very moderate money manager, or had very bad advice. Throughout his life, a third of his very considerable income went paying on the, the interest on his mother's gambling debts. Not, not a very good um, idea at all. But he was a lovely man. He never married. He had quite a lot of girlfriends, and they put them into little houses around, uh, around Chatsworth, which became known as bird cages. Um, uh, we, we went and had tea in one of them the other day. It was lovely. Um, <laughs> And this is one of the things he bought. And it, it, the photograph is good, but it's nothing like as good as the real thing. This is also in the exhibition. This is a, a, a sculpture of about mid-1840s, that sort of time, by an Italian called Raffaele Monti, um, the Vestal Virgin. And it is extraordinary because you, however hard you look, you cannot understand how he's carved the veil over the face, but it's all one piece of stone. It really is worth going to the exhibition just to see that. That wasn't at Chatsworth until 1999. It was in another house which we own in Sussex, which is actually a, a, a language school. And it was used for many years. Luckily, it had quite a high base because the base was used as a cricket stumps. And uh, luckily, it never really got damaged. I hope they were using tennis balls rather than cricket balls. So moving to the sort of nearly the present day, here's a picture of my parents about 30 years ago. Um, and the next picture is a, a portrait of my mother by Lucian Freud, who uh, is a well, was a well-known, he's just passed away, but he's a well-known English portrait, well, artist, not just portrait painter. If you go back, look at that picture, that was, I suppose, about 25, 30 years ago. This was painted when my mother was only 38 in 1958, so probably 25 years before the photograph. There's really a considerable difference. And, one of the things this beautiful thing taught me 
when it arrived at Chatsworth in 1958, and my parents were thrilled and excited by it, they hung it in the drawing room. When their friends came to stay, they were so disgusted by the hideousness of this portrait, they insisted on putting a scarf over it while they sat in the room. <laughs> so um, that was interesting to see two different views of the same work of art, and I was um, 14 at the time, and it made a big impression on me. What it taught me, I think, was don't worry too much what other people think, and if you really like something, go for it. This is one of the, uh, this is a sculpture by uh, Dame Elizabeth Frink, an English artist who was a friend of my parent, my mother particularly, not so much my father. My mother and uh, Liz Frink had a shared interest in, in poultry, and through that they got to know each other, and my mother commissioned a sculpture, not this one, and then we acquired this, and it's in the, in the garden um, at Chatsworth, but I brought it, showed it to you this evening because it's in the exhibition. This is my wife's parents, Teddy and June Hayward Lonsdale, and they had the same influence on my wife, Amanda, as my parents did on me in this one respect. Uh, my mother-in-law particularly, my father-in-law died before I met Amanda, so he, when he was a very young man, um, but my mother-in-law had an absolutely brilliant eye for contemporary art, and she acquired this little drawing, it's a, not much bigger than a postcard, um, from the Zwemer Gallery in the 1930s. She, she had a great eye, but very little uh, ammunition financially. This is a self-portrait uh, by Picasso when he was about 18, I think, Toulouse Le Trek in the bottom corner and the Moulin Rouge in the top corner. Again, with her collection, such as it was, and. Uh, her friends thought it was horrible and extraordinary and uh, uh, very sort of bizarre, the whole thing. So Amanda was brought up in the same atmosphere of, of her mother acquiring things which their friend, their, her parents' friends didn't like, just like I was. So perhaps that opened a door a bit to us having our own approach to collecting. This is William and Laura, our son and daughter-in-law and uh, they've been married for about 12 years now, and um, they are a huge help to us um, more and more. Uh, they're both um, very interested in contemporary art. They're way ahead of us. Um, they've moved on and left us wallowing in their wake, but that, in a very friendly way. They're, they're sort of understanding, and they sort of say, don't we worry, it'll be fine. And this is a picture of Laura, um, which you see, you saw a bit earlier. Uh, when they got married, we asked them to get somebody to do an image, a painting, we assumed, of them for the collection of Chatsworth because it's been a historic tradition that there are collections, you know, members of the family have painted or whatever. And six months later, this appeared. And I must say, we were quite surprised, but we were absolutely delighted. It was made by Michael um, Craig Martin, um, and he's, he's done a few others uh, similar. Uh, he did a drawing, and then it's on a, it's not on a loop, it's on a uh, indeterminate, the, the, the sections of color changed speed, changed color uh, at different speeds, anything between three and 15 seconds. So you could sit in front of it if you've got absolutely nothing else to do for 50 years. As long as you've got a very good memory and didn't blink, you would never see the same image twice. So that's a sort of progression of portraits and we're excited by it. It's, it's, it's in the exhibition in New York and um, I think you'll enjoy it. If it's going slowly, if people walk past it and think, oh, that's a modern picture. And then suddenly they see something changing. They think, oops, uh, it's moving. And of course, you don't expect portraits to move, but this does, and it's wonderful. Um, this is the last slide in this part of the talk. Um, this is a picture of my wife, Amanda, and I in one of the old grand rooms at Chatsworth upstairs. And the point of it really is, apart from her lovely red coat, um, to show you that we've mixed up the old and the new, as every generation always has. So these are ceramics by an Australian called uh, Pippin Drysdale, an absolutely wonderful woman. She lives near Perth in Western Australia, and she makes beautiful, beautiful pots, and there's some of those uh, in, in the exhibition. And so that's sort of a, a bit of an example of, of how we progress. That was amazing. I... <laughs> it's, it's really incredible that you can understand your whole family lineage through what they collected except for those ones that you skipped. I mean, you, know, you went from six to 11, but um, yeah, it's really quite remarkable. I, a couple of quick questions before we move on to David. Do you 
and Amanda collect as a couple? Um, sometimes. Um, I'm keener on ceramics than she is. Um, so I smuggle them in sometimes, and <laughs> then she notices them, and that sort of yeah. can be a little bit interesting. Yeah. She collects jewelry, mostly by an English, yeah. well, a Swiss guy called Andrew Griemer, who was working in the 70s and 80s in London, and she smuggles them in without me I always see. noticing, and that's uh -huh. sort of fine. Um, but together, if it's a big thing, uh -huh. a piece of sculpture or a painting, we do it together. Got it, okay. Um, well, let's move on to um, show you a little bit of David's just sort of jaw-dropping work. Um, this is from Hamilton, which is, um, I guess, possibly the most successful theatrical occasion of the last decade or more. Dear Evan Hansen, and Beetlejuice, for which you were nominated for a Tony. David's not just theater. He's also the biggest TV broadcast of the year. Um, you designed the last Academy Awards. And, um, and tell us a little bit about this. What's happening here? Sure. Um, welcome. Hello. After, <laughs> come on. They give me entrance applause because I have Hamilton house seats. So, you know, <laughs> everyone's here is like, yeah, yeah, we've seen it. Um, so uh, this slide is um, a picture from, I think, as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, I was um, fortunate enough and crazy enough to be engaged um, to create this thing called the Hamilton Exhibition, um, which just recently opened in Chicago. If you haven't had a chance to see it, I really almost never recommend my work because I'm fairly prolific, but it is um, truly a special hybrid kind of experience. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't get asked by someone, um, a brand, an institution, an organization, some intellectual property, a person, um, to make some kind of an immersive experience. This is the new thing that's happening. Every brand is trying to get into these 360 degree experiences um, because the world has changed. Because we spend so much time on our cell phones, we now would pay any amount of money to throw those things away and be told, shut off your phone and engage in this kind of immersive world. Um, and so, you know, guys like the Duke show up and say, we want to make experiences where you can walk through our properties. So Hamilton, the show, um, has become such an interesting portal into a conversation about early America. Uh, and every day, Lin-Manuel Miranda, who's a friend and collaborator, obviously, um, would get tweeted, how come you're not talking about Thomas Jefferson's birthday? How come you're not talking about, you know, uh, Alexander Hamilton and Eliza's um, anniversary? And so we, the creators of Hamilton, decided to work with um, historians Joanne Freeman and Annette Gordon-Reed, who are the two foremost um, Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian historians in the world to create a museum slash art installation slash um, walk through 360 degree immersive uh, experience of Alexander Hamilton's life. Um, and it is basically an airplane hangar. We built a building um, in Chicago and uh, created this 40,000 square foot experience. Um, that's a, that is the Schuyler Mansion. Basically, there are clickables. You can learn all about every single person um, in that room. And it is an 18 gallery experience, which is quite stunning, narrated by Lynn Manuel Miranda in your ear. And it was a two and a half year endeavor, um, which was um, pretty amazing and kind of uh, an interesting moment to complete while engaging um, in the unbelievable task of trying to find a way to wrestle a 470-year-old home um, to the ground and figure out a way to, I mean, look at that. I like you the know, Imagine getting a phone that. call and saying, do you want to collaborate with a Duke? And then having a conversation three days later with the Duke about Instagram. Seriously, this happened, we talked about it, and we said, how could we possibly show um, uh, highlights and a cross-section of um, the home, the collection, the lineage, um, and bring it to America? But when I was fortunate enough to go there, I was completely 
overwhelmed because you could probably make an exhibition and a walkthrough experience of any single gallery. Um, it is stunning. These photographs, if you can believe it, don't do it justice. People who have been here, uh, been there know. Um, and so my job is to work with people um, to try and figure out what is in the DNA of the experience. And I realized pretty quickly I was um, way, way, way in over my head. Um, but I was allowed to, because I gave him some Hamilton house seats, um, I was allowed to walk around the grounds and the, um, the physical plant by myself. Um, I realized, because I was privileged to be a guest of the Duke and Duchess in their private quarters, that I was having an experience for the first day or so that was not um, like what you would have if you were um, a regular tourist kind of going to see the grounds. And I asked if I could have permission to go around and sort of contemplate um, quietly in each one of the rooms um, to see if I could uh, let it wash over me and get any inspiration. And what I was struck by was kind of what we talked about earlier, this unbelievable layering. I mean, the architecture, the way the walls meet the ceiling, the way every single molding is turned, the way the exquisitely handcrafted and thought through details, whether it is embossed leather wallpaper, whether it is um, beautiful turns of table uh, legs or you know details of chairs, I was really struck by these details. And so I started clicking photographs of just corners of rooms. And I, I said to the Duke, um, I've got this crazy idea. What if we sliced through uh, these corners and we went into, think, honey, I shrunk the kids. We zoomed in very, very, very closely to the details of these spaces. And I felt like somehow, because we could never possibly, forget about money, forget about time, we could never possibly recreate the smell, the touch, the heartbeat, the feeling that this home has. Um, I thought through scale, through completely changing the size of these things, you'd be able to zoom in on these details of which every single one of them tells a very, very meaningful story to someone. Um, and also, we could maybe just highlight these things that you wouldn't necessarily have on the journey if you kind of walked through. So what you're seeing here is a coronation chair, which might on its face um, not seem like anything other than the most spectacular chair you've ever seen. But if you zoom into the other po portion there, I sat there and, and I looked at this chair and I took a picture. And then if you wanna go to the next slide, I started doing with um, this incredibly gifted illustrator, Javier Amaredes, who works with me and has for years, um, we started just doing these very, very rough um, artist impressions of what it could be like. So it began to be a spark of the idea. I, of course, said, what do you think? And he said, I don't quite understand how you're going to be able to achieve this because, of course, we all think about um, sculpture like something like a 16 or 12 foot tall, um, you know, lion's claw uh, table leg uh, or chair leg might be, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not more, dollars. Um, but I come from the world where we make, you know, miracles for no money and magic out of contact lenses and dental floss, and we put it together, and then they go like, oh my god, Hamilton. So, um, uh, you think I'm kidding. Um, don't touch the walls. So this was my kind of artist impression of what I thought we could do, because what we're trying to do by bringing Chatsworth to New York and Sotheby's is look at each one of these pieces and think, this is not a white box, white wall art gallery, bless you. This is a home. And I did not choose these details. Some duke or duchess or someone from generations ago chose them. And part of what we're trying to show is to contextualize the art in its actual kind of natural habitat. And so it felt really kind of amazing. There's, a, there's what happened last night. Um, what felt kind of amazing is to think about curating each of um, the pieces of art in and around and surrounded by what you would see it in, in the house. And you said you were surprised that they let the Da Vinci come to the show. I stood there and said, it's gotta come to the show. I sort of you know, represented the, um, the voice of America and said, we need a Rembrandt, we need a Da Vinci, we need a Picasso, but then also, and happily, there are exquisite pieces of clothing jewelry, sculpture, ceramics, paintings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
So what I've tried to do here, you can see the, the crown is sitting there. Um, this is our kind of second gallery that you see. We start the experience, actually we were just talking about it earlier, with beautiful unearthed home movies. When you walk into the gallery and the experience, what I wanted to try and do is humanize wh what does it mean to be a duke? What does it mean to be a duchess? We all know Downton Abbey, but wh what does it mean actually, and why do I care as someone in 2019? That's kind of what I do for a living, try and make people, frame it for people in the audiences as they're going to journey through this thing. And what was important was, let's start with humanizing these beautiful home movies, learning to ski, um, you know, playing around on the grounds of Chatsworth House, and then when you come around the corner, you see this huge, you know, basically 270 degree massive drone shot video which really then announces where we are. But you can see we've started with the crown and on the other side of the gallery is actually what looks like a blank wall. Um, it's a beautiful piece of wallpaper that comes from a, um, a bedroom. But when you hold up an iPad in front of it, it basically is a digital augmented reality um, timeline and picture gallery when you hold it up magically through technology, um, all of the uh, portraits of the Duke show up kind of in order and there's a sound that goes along with it so you can digitally hold up an iPad and learn about each of the Dukes. I mean, not as well and articulately as what we just heard, but you can understand kind of from whence we came, um, how we got there and it sort of frames and contextualizes what does it mean to do, be a Duke, who have the other Dukes been and who um, currently inhabits the, the spot. Um, but what's incredible about it is we're able to, through technology, bring pieces that we could not, could not make the trip, um, and we're able to make something that's really fun and engaging right off the bat, and then we kind of go down the rabbit hole um, of the experience, and with each one of the pieces, we get to blow up a detail. And so, so David, you matched the object from Chatsworth with this sort of enormous set piece. Exactly, I mean, what we, we were sort of working on parallel paths, so we were kind of trying to figure out what pieces we could bring over, um, and once we had that, uh -huh. because I had, you know, taken a lot of pictures, and also the, the staff, I must say, at Chatsworth um, is incredible. They are so attentive, so knowledgeable, so, so I mean, really um, beyond. I've worked at many galleries and in many different experiences, and, and their attention to detail and their willingness to help in this process has been incredible. So it felt appropriate that the crown um, or the tiara was sort of encased, if you will, in the coronation chair. So we've tried to match um, the pieces to what they um, should be next to. Here is a bracket from the home. Um, you know, when, so casual. When you go into the vault, or the, I don't know what, what these rooms are, but you, you walk around and it just unfolds one room after the other after the other. And what I will say is, um, not just the layering on the walls, but the architecture is layered in that way. This, what inspired me truly about this bracket was, I had seen all of the silver and gold gilt pieces, um, tableware and other things, and I thought, what could we create with dimension that could allow an audience to be able to walk around the, you know, we thought about, could we make a dining room set? Um, you saw that incredible kind of red and white dining room. There was no possible way. Um, I felt like finding a piece of architecture in which we could curate these beautiful pieces um, would be inspiring and exciting. And everywhere that we can in the exhibition, we, we kind of float the pieces in the middle of the room. So here's an example of an artist sketch. We move into rendering form once we sort of have the, the form. We now start to work into the color. And then, of course, we engage the services of, you know, some other incredible craftspeople. This is um, a process shot from the scene shop in Atlanta, um, hand carving one of the pieces that we drew that were taken directly from photographs of details of pieces of architecture. This happens to be a piece of a chair. Um, and if you want to hit the next slide, you can see this is the finished product of that original sketch, which you can see, and you can walk all the way around it. And it, and it felt like, I mean, I don't know, it'd be interesting to hear what you felt, but to me, because it, it is, it's important, all of the colors, all the architecture I've said now are taken from the home. Did it feel like we did it, did, did, it, did it feel like it's actually, um, 
I don't know, accurately recreates the feelings, the textures of the home, or did it feel weird? I mean, how is it now that we've made it? Just, just imagine if those pieces of <clears throat> silver gilt and silver were on a sort of table. You know, that would be quite boring. You just elevated them up and made them, they are beautiful things in themselves, but you put them in a sort of wonderful, on a wonderful pedestal theatrical, which is exactly as I was trying to explain earlier, that was why the house was built, that's why it was decorated, that's why a lot of the things were collected, it was it, the theatrical impression of, of power and wealth and so on. may not be deeply attractive, but that's how it was. Um, I happen to be very proud of it. It's not actually my style, but it was their style, and you've reflected it perfectly. Well, thank you. I mean, listen, I, it is a very difficult task as a designer, creative director, to try and turn the needle and the knob of how crazy in one direction or the other I can go. Obviously, because we create things out of thin air, we can go as big and as lavish as we want. And one of the things that's interesting about um, this experience is trying to curate things with a pretty moder in a modern way. But I think the reason why um, this take works is because uh, although the scale is pretty modern and the lighting is pretty modern, we have put them in and around pe the, the details that are traditional. Um, and I think had we gone really wild and out there, um, it probably wouldn't have worked. But because I think the heartbeat of it, you know, it's interesting when you go to the experience, in every one of the pieces, um, next to every one of the pieces, you can see a plaque that shows you a photograph of the actual room that it's from. And you can sort of like zoom in yourself and say, oh, I see that chair rail, there's that thing. And I think that that's what makes it work. Yeah, you really captured the DNA of it, as you said. This is really one of the most astounding set pieces ever created for a museum. And I think we're seeing the Rembrandt that we saw earlier in the, uh, in the exhibition. So just out of frame is a photograph of that music room. This was the, I, I believe the story goes, um, it's beautiful embossed leather wallpaper. And someone came through, didn't love it, and painted over it. Is that? Is that the leather was put by uh, the sixth duke, the bachelor duke. Uh, actually completely wrecking what the first Duke had, had put in the decoration. But so, you know, he had different tastes, different times. So he put this leather, which he'd seen somewhere in France and thought it was absolutely wonderful. And then my great-grandmother in about 1910, um, the Bachelor Duke died in, uh, say, 1858. So sort of two generations later, of course, she hated that Victorian stuff. She absolutely couldn't bear it. It was so vulgar, so over the top, she thought. Uh, and she thought, okay, so here we are, we've got this leather, we can't, we, 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 don't, we can't take it down, we can't do anything new. So she got a paint box out, she's quite a good artist, and she painted the leather blue. And that actually looked quite cheerful and it was quite fun. It would absolutely not be allowed now because we'd be interfering with a historic um, decoration. But I, I think that is a typical example of how all our homes have their layers. Different generations do different things in the same spaces. Well, that's one of the great lines from that little film we saw at the beginning. There are layers upon layers upon layers. Um, I'm just going to show you one more, one more view from the exhibition, just to, to give you a sense of the variety of, of objects that were generously set sent over from Chatsworth. Um, I hope you're getting the idea that we really want you to come. It is <laughs> open every single day of the week between now and September 13th. You can just, between now and September 13th, it's free. It's free. And by the way, none I of this pay what you will. You can't pay us. We simply won't accept your money to get in. I'll, I'll get to a way we might take your money a different way. But, um, but uh, because you're here, you can also get a group tour if you want, also free. Just go to sotheby's.com slash chatsworth. There's lots and lots of stories. There's lots of buttons that prompt you to, to sign up. Because more than anything, we just want to share this with the public. Just uh, we, we really share the Duke's passion with the idea of sharing all of this with the public. It's, it's an end unto itself. So if you... Uh, if if you, once, once September 13th happens, then all this stuff is gonna be packed up and sent back to Chatsworth. It is not for sale, even though it's at Sotheby's. Wanna make that really clear. <laughs> However, if you just feel this tinge of, wow, I really wanna collect like a Cavendish, we do actually happen to have a uh, selling exhibition called 
inspired by Chatsworth. And it really is, it's just a wonderful array of art that's, um, that reflects some of the changing tastes. You can get a chair with a claw foot. David, I don't know if, if you buy the chair, you also If you buy it, it, I'll draw it. You'll make an Promise. enormous uh, sculpture to, to set it on, I don't know. Uh, but there's silver, there's jewels, um, there's even a fabulous Lucian Freud portrait. Um, and actually what's really a wonderful touch is that um, this artist whom Stoker mentioned before, Pippin Drysdale, um, I, how did you discover this artist? I saw her at, uh, at an art fair. I didn't see her. I saw her work uh -huh. at an art fair and um, fell in love with it. We've been collecting yeah. it now for about 15 years. And so not only is there some of her work uh, in our exhibition, but there is, uh, through Adrian Sassoon, yeah. who's one of her dealers, uh, some of her work for sale. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, it's just a wonderful opportunity to present the work of, of an artist who people don't know here very much. Um, likewise, ceramics, which are so important still in, in England, really don't get their due here. Um, there's actually a similar work, I think, to this one that's at the top of the grand staircase that we saw in one of the, one yes, of the it's slides. So it's, although, because it, it's such a big space, it's a long way away and so it's quite small. Mm. This is Felicity Elieff, uh, who teaches at the Royal College of Art. I, I, I love her work. Yeah, so that's, that's another reason to come also free and open to the public. Um, why don't I just go through a couple of additional slides and tell you a little, give the Duke a, a chance to talk a little bit about um, his vision for Chatsworth in the future. Uh, and um, we do have a few minutes for questions. If you'd like to ask the Duke or ask David anything about what you've heard today, or if you have any insights to share, we'll have people with mics. Um, while you're thinking about those questions, just want to um, share with you a couple of things. One, um, in case you're wondering why this happened, it's, I don't, you know, it's not, not as if we just called up the Duke and had this idea. The Duke has, very close, has been very close to Sotheby's for many, many years, has sat on the board of Sotheby's for more than 25 years, and has been an incredible partner with Sotheby's in many different ways. And this slide actually shows, uh, represents a long uh, series of exhibitions of large-scale sculpture that Sotheby's brought to the grounds of Chatsworth which are fantastic. This is 2006, it's Robert Indiana, and we'd only just arrived, and uh, we were, we'd lived in Yorkshire for 25 years, so although we, n we were known at Chatsworth, we weren't well known, and uh, it had been a time of big change. My father had passed away, and my mother had moved out, and so people were a little bit nervous about change, which they always are. I mean, new ideas are great if they're your ideas, but they're not so great if they're somebody else's ideas quite often. So we had this exhibition, uh, Sotheby's provided about 25, 30 pieces of contemporary sculpture. We stuck this big Robert Indiana on a, this, what we call the Cascade, which was put by the first Duke in about 1700. And a lot of people locally thought it was permanent and understandably and rightly they thought that was a really terrible idea, but actually it was only there for a couple of months and we did it for, Sotheby's did it with us for 13 years and it became very successful. People longed to know what the new thing was. Now the reason I show that is that there it is in the middle of this cascade. If you could just move on to the, this is the other view down the hill of the cascade, as I say, about 1700. Really beautiful, a major sort of gathering place on the warm days for, for children to paddle and, and have fun. And, and it's a sort of real center for family activity. And it's very beautiful, it's important historically. It was copied or inspired by the Chateau de Mali which the chateau doesn't exist anymore, but the cascade does still. And it's one of the, the most iconic objects, pieces of, of sculpture, if you like, at Chatsworth. But if you look underneath, it's not great. Um, it's, um, you know, water does terrible things to stonework. Uh, it, it's damaged it very, very badly. And we are seriously concerned about how we're going to keep that water flowing. The water is plentiful but it's doing so much damage. So we are hoping to raise enough money to pay for a full res restoration of the cascade, because if we don't, we'll just have to turn the water off, rope it off, and sort of forget it, which would be very sad. So one of our ideas with this exhibition is just to see if there's an appetite in this incredibly generous country to help us do some of the things quicker and sooner than we can do. We spend a great deal of the, the, the charitable trust that runs Chatsworth has an endowment and spends that endowment on restoration every year, um, but we would like to do more and we would like to see if there are people out there who might help us. This is just one example. There are 
some other things which when you get to the exhibition you'll see. Yeah, well, I mean, this is, this is a good place for that message. Not only is this uh, a community that has been for artists, has ha been a magnet for collectors, but it's also a place with tremendous philanthropists, tremendous generosity. And um, we've made it possible for you to learn a little bit more about, about, the, about Chatsworth in America, which is a new organization that allows uh, Americans to make a tax-deductible contribution to the trust. Uh, we'll be playing a video about it uh, here and in the lobby, and there's some literature. Love for you to pick it up um, or discover more about it um, on the website. So now, this is the chance to ask the Duke or ask David about anything that's on your mind. Do we have any, uh, any interesting questions out there? Please, uh, I think we have some people with microphones. It's a nice community where people pass microphones down the rows. Hello. I'd like to know if, if you make the decisions to acquire the art, and do you ever deacquisition art to buy other art, or, just, or do you have to answer to the trust with respect to the purchases? So the question is, um, are you the sole arbiter of what, what, what enters the collection, and do you ever uh, prune the collection or make any deacquisitions? Well, the, the, thank you. That's an interesting question. Um, we collect in a small way on our own account. And for that, it's just a question of Amanda and I agreeing or agreeing to not agree. But uh, major acquisitions are dealt with by um, the Chatsworth House Trust, the charity that looks after Chatsworth. And it has a dedicated art purchase fund, uh, which uh, was endowed by my father, myself, and my son, about 20 years ago, we, we contributed a certain amount of money to the charity, which we can't now withdraw. And so if there is, for instance, the painting of the sixth duke as a young man, that was acquired by the Chatsworth House Trust about 20 years ago with money from that art purchase fund. And those acquisitions have to be agreed by the trustees of the Chatsworth House Trust, which is an independent trust. The family is on it, but in a minority. So there are independent trustees who, who agree those acquisitions. And so there's two things that they have to satisfy. Is it an appropriate acquisition, either historic or contemporary, and are we being taken for a ride by the dealer? Obviously, we wouldn't be taking a ride for a, by an auction house, that goes without saying, uh, because the auction <laughs> price is the auction price. But So if it's a dealer, are they adding it on because they know it's going to Chatsworth? And uh, we have ways of, of making sure that really trying to make sure that doesn't happen. And it works really well. And uh, we have a lot of friends who are very good dealers. Uh, the second part of it was... Yeah, do, you, do you ever... Uh, oh, yes. Do, we do. We have deacquisitioned. We sold a, a Raphael drawing um, uh, here at Sotheby's about four years ago uh, because we needed money to, uh, to conserve the house. We've had, we spent about $42 million conserving the house in the last 12 years, and that was largely funded by selling this drawing by Raphael. It was a really, really beautiful sheet. Uh, and it's very sad to see it go, but the house is more important. And I think it's now in really good condition, probably as good a condition as it was when it was built. And I hope it'll last. We've done, redone all the surfaces, the services. We've cleaned it, we've repaired the stonework, and the roof is in good condition, so on. So we did that, make that deacquisition. We don't usually sell the stuff that we've bought, usually because not many other people would want to buy it. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, one day it'll have its, their moment in the sun, maybe in 100 years' time when people have got used to it, whatever. So uh, we do do, we, we, William and I have talked about it at length, and um, we are absolutely determined not to deacquisition again if we can possibly help it. But you never know, it just depends on all sorts of outside things. Yes, in the orange. How have you prepared the younger generation, either your son or grandson, to uh, take the role that you've had with this, with this property? Uh, and do you feel that uh, they're, they're capable of undertaking that high responsibility? Well, that, uh, 
I was asked that, I went to, to Biltmore for the first time about 25 years ago. I, I'm sure some of you have been to Biltmore. It's a really, really wonderful place. It's an exemplar of how to show a property off to visitors. And Bill Cecil, who runs it, was the chairman, asked me what I was doing to train William, our son, who will take over the title if the title still exists. And much to my embarrassment, I had to say, do you know, I haven't really done anything. And because he asked that question, William and I started having much more serious conversations about the future. He was a photographer at the time, and he did that for a bit longer, but increasingly he's become more and more part of the management team. He went to Harvard Business School, uh, 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 three years of three weeks a year, I think. He went to a, a quite a long course at Getty for the Getty Museum for people who run museums. So he, although he's not a museum curator, he learned about how they approach that. Uh, and he's doing, he's doing quite a lot of other sorts of training, bits and pieces, sort of finance for non-financial managers and things like that. So I think that he, and he is at Chatsworth more and more. His wife, Laura, uh, has three young children. They, they're all at school in London, so she can't come as much. But she, she, she's always been in the fashion industry, and she's hugely helpful on that front. And she, she helped to curate a wonderful exhibition called House Style, which was also curated by Hamish Bowles uh, here, I mean from here, uh, two years ago. So Laura is involved in some aspects. William is involved increasingly in all the aspects. He's becoming much more of a, he's chancellor of the local university. Uh, he's just had his 50th birthday and he will do a fantastic job. Ah, that is a comfort. Um, any other questions? Whatever is easier for you to get to. How about um, up in the front? Yes, right. Four rows back. You mentioned that you had made an acquisition at an art fair. Which art fairs do you find most um, promising t for you? Uh, which art fairs? Well, I try to sort of control myself a little bit. Um, Collect uh, in London is a, is a craft uh, fair in, in the Satcher Gallery, and that's very much my level. Um, Masterpiece is just opened in London now, uh, and Pad, which is during Freeze, which is also um, sort of contemporary design and so on. I find them both thrilling, but they they are sort of they are the Faubourg Saint Honoré, the Bond Street, the Madison Avenue of that world, and they tend to be quite um, pricey things. So I like looking. I spend a lot more time looking than I do actually acquiring, obviously, and I, I like going to Friedman Bender and I like to go down to Chelsea and just look around and, and it's sad that Moss doesn't exist anymore because I used to always go there. Um, uh, and there's various places that I regularly uh, uh, look at and see what's, what's happening. Um, and there's artists who make things who we keep in touch with and add to um, because that's in a way the most interesting. If you have worked by an artist, whether it's ceramic or furniture or paintings, of over 20 or 30 years, I find that really thrilling. So once you've got to know an artist through acquiring his work or her work, then you keep in touch. Next question. Hi. Um, first of all, we're huge Dear Evan Hansen fans. Your work was amazing. Um, my question is, what is a challenge you faced when designing this exhibit that you haven't f that you haven't faced before when you were creating set design for Broadway musicals? Um, well, uh, <laughs> you don't put a Da Vinci on the stage of a Broadway play. Um, I mean, listen, the, uh, many people want to know what the difference is between the Oscars or a play or any experiences that I do, and. It, conceptually, the answer is there is no difference. From 40,000 feet above sea level, you meet with a client and a collaborator, um, and you try and find out what is the story they want to tell. Um, in the case of Hamilton, Lynn and Tommy, the director, had a really clear sense that this was a, um, a, a version of um, the founding of our country told through hip hop music, essentially. And in this instance, it was um, exactly what we've talked about over the last hour or so. And then you try and ask a thousand questions and get to the root of what it is that we want people to feel when we go through it. The difference is, of course, here we're dealing with priceless pieces of art. Um, there, 
we are dealing with something that is kind of a train. You know exactly when it starts. It has a certain speed and you get off and people s sit like this and watch it in a presentational way. Here it was important for us to be able to walk around and without obviously damaging the pieces, it, uh, immerse yourself in as much as possible the story as you, as you can. And um, so the, the short answer is there's no difference. The longer answer is you have to really think about um, the way in which you're presenting the stuff and um, the way in which the audience or the patrons are interacting with it. But it is really just storytelling in three dimensions, both of those things. I do architecture and restaurants and interiors and all sorts of other things, and it's all the same thing. You know, restaurants are basically theater with food. <laughs> and, and by the way, I didn't mention this. Uh, David has also designed exhibitions at the Gagosian Gallery. Um, uh, he also designed Americana Week for us. So, you know, this is not the first time that he's been asked to, um, to bring his skills to bear on presenting art. Um, another thing to note is that you really can't escape David. Um, wherever you go, you're really, uh, you know, you're seeing his work in so many different places. And this has been so illuminating to me to really understand your creative process. You've both been so, so generous. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Can you talk a little bit about the public programming at Chatsworth House, uh, number of visitors, and um, how does it interact with the public? Thank you. I, I, um, the sort of bold fact uh, figures are we have about plus or minus 600,000 visitors a year. Um, uh, uh, between a third and a half of those go into the house. If you buy a house ticket, you get the garden as well, or you can just go into the garden. There's also another attraction, which is an adventure playground and a sort of farmyard for, particularly for younger people. So, th so then we also have events in the park, um, outside the garden, uh, and that probably attracts another 100,000. Uh, a lot of people come and park in our car park, and then they walk in the, in the park, they, particularly when the weather's warm, uh, and they go and picnic by the river and so on. So we reckon we have about a million people a year come uh, onto the place, um, which is great. Uh, it's always been open to the public. After all, you don't build a house to show off and then tell people to go away. So they've embraced that. And even in, in the 1840s, there was something like 40,000 people came in, in a year. And when, when the trains came for the first time, I don't know, when, 1890, 1880, um, I should know, but I don't. Anyway something like 80,000 people came over one weekend. So we had to have, they had to have time tickets. They were told to wait, walk, walk around the garden. I think they were supplied with refreshments. So I think that some of them got quite what you might call tired by the end of the day. Um, and I think they had a great day out. Whether any of them could remember it at all, I have no idea. But um, so visitors have been a big feature of Chatsworth. What we're trying to do now is add to the attractions in specialized ways. We're, we're, we've got a much bigger, better educational program than we ever had before. We have a wonderful education team, which is led by my son, William, um, because he, after all, has young children and he, he knows what they are interested in. Uh, and we have um, all sorts of programs for young people and for not so young people. We have programs in the garden uh, teaching people how our gardeners make the place look so beautiful. We have textile programs. We have um, special tours for, say, looking at old master drawings or silver or jewelry, or whatever it happens to be. And so those events take place all through the year. Um, irritatingly, I'm going to say, look at the website, because I certainly won't be able to remember everything. But we are very keen to spread the interest, and particularly to have specialist uh, um, things which people are, you know, maybe only 10, 15, 20 people. Um, we have a different uh, exhibition every year. Uh, this year, it's called The Dog, a Celebration at Chatsworth which was my wife's idea, and uh, the hashtag is Chatswoof, which I'm sure you'll be able to remember. Uh, very popular. She's done a great job with that, and she does... Did I tell you about Instagram? Did I tell you? <laughs> Obsessed. Um, I'd like to think... I'd take the credit for Chatswoof. I'm sure it probably wasn't my idea, but anyway, I'm going to pretend it was. Um, it doesn't always happen as, as easily as that, and so um, every year, as I say, uh, Laura did an exhibition of fashion a couple of years ago, uh, and Amanda's got the dog exhibition, which paintings, everything from Jeff Koons to Constable. Uh, and it, it's really a great exhibition. A lot of loans from all sorts of places. So we, we have a, I've 
I think the word would be vibrant program. At least I like to think so. And we, and we, we've only just got going. We've got lots of things to do in our minds. We're a little bit project heavy, to be honest. You ask the staff; they'll tell you. <laughs> okay. On that, Stoker, David, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.